Hi, welcome back to Electronic Structure and Bonding in Inorganic Chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of things in this video. Number one, we're going to look at uh, the spectrochemical series and different components of it. And then we're going to mainly focus on bonding between the d orbitals of the transition metal and then the and then with the ligands um, and their particular orbitals. In this video, we're going to look at two main things. We're going to look at some of these um, different classes of molecules in the spectrochemical series. And then we're going to look at the interaction between the ligand orbitals and the metal's d orbitals. And we're hopefully going to see that there's different kinds of bonding that can take place, and we'll look at the rationale behind that. Okay, now, we have this concept of weak field ligands and strong field ligands. If you remember um, from one, a couple videos ago or whatever it was, these three right here that I've circled in purple, um, those are going to be your strong field ligands. And for most applications, there's not very many of them in inorganic chemistry. Um, these are the three most common ones that we see. And then the ones that I have boxed in pink and blue, those are weak field ligands. However, the weak field ligands can be divided into two groups. The ones that I've are boxed in pink, those are what are referred to as pi donors, okay? The ones that I've boxed in blue are sigma donors, and then the three strong field ligands here are gonna be pi acceptors, okay? What we need to go over is exactly how this bonding works. And this, this knowledge that you're gonna get hopefully here is applicable in, in this uh, level of inorganic chemistry, but any kind of advanced inorganic chemistry or molecular orbital uh, bonding kind of class, talking about the theory, um, this is very applicable. All right, so hopefully we know by now that metals have five available d orbitals, okay? We have the two quadratic orbitals, dz squared and dx squared minus y squared. Then we have three orbitals down here, dzx, dyz, and dxy. I'm going to remind you of the main differences between these two groups. And by the way, remember, this group up here, these are the E sub G orbitals, and down here, these are the T 2G orbitals, okay, that we saw in the, uh, in the octahedral splitting diagram, all right? The main difference between these is if you look at the T 2G, look at all the axes. Okay, where are the axes? Okay, this is the X axis, Y axis, Okay, and then the other axis going perpendicular is the z-axis. I'll even label that, okay? Notice that for all the orbitals in, in, that are classified as the T2g, these three down here, all the axes never go through an area of electron density, okay? Remember, the areas of electron density are these lobes of the d orbital, okay? Those axes never go through the lobes. They never go through areas of electron density. They only go through this node right here in the center. They all go through this node and that's the only part that they basically touch. The quadratic orbitals, E sub G up here, the X and Y axes go directly through areas of electron density. In terms of the DX squared minus Y squared, they go th through all these four lobes. And then for the DZ squared, they go through this sort of donut looking structure, okay? That's very important. So let me sort of put it to you this way, okay? I'm going to do this in two dimensions, although understand this applies for the Z dimension, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a hypothetical axis, okay? This is going to be the X axis and this is going to be the Y axis, okay? Um, in fact, let me do this just for simplicity. I'm gonna put the X axis on this side and the Y axis here. All right, there's a reason I'm gonna do that, all right. The general rule of thumb is the following. I don't care if it's a pi bond, or I don't care if it's a sigma bond. Okay, pi electrons, sigma electrons, I don't care if it's head-to-head -head overlap, side-to-side -side overlap. Any ligand, if the ligand is over here, if it's over here, it could be over on this side, down here, whatever. The ligands can only approach the metal, which remember is right here in the center. The ligands can only approach the metal along one of these axes, okay? And you might say, and this is a very unintuitive thing in all reality, you might say, well, couldn't a ligand, couldn't a ligand approach from right here? I mean, 
I mean, that seems like it's possible. Well, in all reality, it, for this theory, it's not, okay? There is a predetermined x-axis, a y-axis, and then coming right out at you from the center, there's a z-axis. And it turns out that all six ligands can only approach the metal and form a bond if they're moving towards it along any of these three axes. Remember, the z-axis is also going into the screen and then towards you, okay? Can only interact coming along one of these axes. Okay, that's a very important point. So let me, let me pose a question to you. Suppose I have a metal D orbital that looks like this. So let's say I have this particular metal D orbital, and I'll even ask you which one it is. Which orbital is this? Well, it's in the XY plane, so it must be DXY, right? Okay, so that's the orbital. We'll even put one of these, or two of these lobes in phase, right? Okay, now my question to you is this. Could this d orbital, the dxy specifically, can it sigma bond? Well, what is a sigma bond? It's head-to-head -head overlap. So that means the orbital must, since it's head-to-head, -head, must, it must approach, it must approach, okay, al along this axis, okay? It has to approach along this axis. It couldn't just come from that direction, okay? It has to come along any of the axes, all right? So my question is, does this bond form? The answer is no, because this orbital right here does not line head to head up with any of these four lobes. So that does not happen, okay? That does not happen, all right? Now, let me, let me do this. Let me actually clear this part right here, and then let me make new axes, and let me do another situation, all right? So let's say, instead I draw this orbital now. Let me do this one, all right? So now let me have a, a slightly different orbital, okay? This one is still in the xy plane, but now, remember, we have the axes running through the lobes, right? So which orbital is this? Well, this is no longer the dxy. This particular orbital is the dx squared minus y squared orbital. Now, my question is, if I was to try and do the same kind of ligand bond, this one right here, I'm going to have to make this one the, the in-phase one. It has, this, this ligand orbital has to approach along one of these axes. Can it interact with the dx squared minus y squared? And the answer is yes, it can form a sigma bond. That's because both of these lobes of both orbitals line up exactly on the axis, okay? So that's a really, really important point, okay? Now, you could also say another thing. Couldn't I also have another ligand over here that maybe had, oops, let me do this, maybe it had side-to-side -side overlap, right? Couldn't it form interactions like that? Well, no, it couldn't because this ligand is not approaching on any of these three axes. So that's out of the question, okay? But this sigma interaction can happen with the dx squared minus y squared, okay? So let's go ahead and look at the way bonding is thought to occur using molecular orbital theory. Let's talk about the ones in pink pi donors, all right? So these, from iodide on the left all the way to oxide, O2 minus, these are going to be your pi donors, all right? And they're going to specifically interact with the dxy, dxz, and dyz. Why is that? Well, let's go ahead and draw some hypothetical axes through this. So watch very carefully. So axes right there and right there. All right? Okay, let's just suppose for simplicity this is the x-axis, y-axis. So we'll talk about the dxy orbital. The reason pi electron, or this is, it could be, you can have pi donation from this p orbital right here. The reason you can have pi donation is because because these lobes are not actually on the axes, then you can have a ligand approach along the x-axis and it can overlap with those two lobes side to side. So one important thing is that when you're dealing with these three T2g orbitals down here, because all of the lobes are not on any of the three axes, they can only interact with p orbitals that are overlapping side to side. So side to side overlap, which remember translates to 
essentially a pi bond. And you hopefully see this p orbital right here is overlapping side to side, okay? So all of these have a tendency to be pi donors, all right? Now let's think about sigma donors. Look at this example right here. I had a dx squared minus y squared orbital. I said a ligand could overlap head to head because it has to approach along one of the three axes and it just so happens that this orbital, this d orbital, has all of its lobes on the axes, okay? So that means that when I'm dealing with these orbitals over here, the two quadratics in the e, that are classified as e sub g, the ligands that interact with those orbitals are sigma donors. So look over here. So this is supposedly an sp3 orbital right there. It's again, if we draw our axes, let's assume it is a, a dx squared minus y squared xy. That sp3 orbital is approaching along the x-axis and it can't form a pi bond because then the those, you know, those, that side-to-side -side overlap has nothing to overlap with the d orbital because the lobes are on the axes. So this is a requirement to be head-to-head -head overlap. And because it's head-to-head -head overlap, these ligands right here, boxed in blue, they have to have a sigma bond, essentially a sigma bond because it's head-to-head -head overlap. And we generally are going to observe that with these two orbitals, the e sub g orbitals, dz squared and dx squared minus y squared. Okay, if we are looking at a ligand approaching along the z-axis, then that ligand can interact with the, if it's head-to-head -head overlap, it can interact with the um, dz squared lobes up here. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now for pi acceptors, these are going to be a little bit different, all right? So we're still going to be dealing with, because it's pi bonding, okay, we're still going to be dealing with the T2G orbitals, okay? The T2G D orbitals, which are going to be DXY, DXZ, and DYZ. And what's going to happen is the ligand is going to approach, the ligand orbital is going to approach the D orbital in the same way as we saw up here. What I want you to notice is look at the direction the arrow is going up here, the pi donors. The, the electron sharing is going from the pi electrons of the ligand to the d orbital. That's why the ligand is a pi donor. Here it's the opposite. The metal is actually donating electron density to the, the pi, the areas, the orbitals with the pi electrons in these ligands. So this is d to pi star, whereas this was p to d, okay? So pi acceptors, it's actually the metal that has a tendency to promote some electron density. Pi acceptors, those ligands, which are boxed in purple, have a tendency to experience something called pi backbonding. And we're going to talk about that in another video. It turns out that pi backbonding, one way to think about it, is sort of a resonance, okay? Sort of like resonance from organic chemistry. Um, there's a shift in electron density, and it's, it's fairly intuitive, I think, once you've had organic. And we'll cover that in the next video. But suffice it to say, when we have pi acceptors, and that ligand forms a pi bond with the d orbital, there's some metal electron density that's shifted to um, the ligand orbital. In that case, it's a pi star orbital. All right. And the main thing to really get from this is not really, you know, to just memorize, memorize, memorize. It's just to have some intuitive sense of everything. Okay, look at this diagram. Okay, we have our d orbitals. Okay, you really have to remember where the lobes are of that d orbital. Are they on the axes, like they are in the e sub g um, orbitals, or are they between the axes, meaning the axes never cross a lobe, like they are in these three down here, the T2g, because that's going to determine what those orbitals are best at forming. Are they going to form head-to-head -head overlap or sigma bonds, like they do for the e sub g, or are they going to form pi bonds, like they do for these three down here, okay? And it really is a fact that these three down here form pi bonds, and these two up here, the quadratic orbitals, form sigma bonds, okay? The other thing to remember is that it's just the way the theory works. You just have to go with it. The ligand can only approach the metal, which, if you remember, is right here in the center. 
the ligand can only approach the metal along one of the three axes, either along the x-axis, the y-axis, or coming out of the screen or into it, the z-axis. Okay, so that's very important to remember. But hopefully that gives you a little bit of intuition of how this bonding is thought to occur and the rationale behind why we think that. All right, so make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In the next video, we're actually gonna talk about pi back bonding. See you in the next video.